introduce uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar uh, MC. He is an intensive care specialist in Max Hospital, Shivamogga. He is alumnus of JNV Asan Karnataka. He will be speaking about uh, uh, ICU, where it is inevitable to encounter uh, uh, the sick COVID patients, and uh, the uh, situation is uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, I mean, so easy to get uh, uh, contacted with COVID by infection to healthcare workers in ICU. Please, uh, Dr. Shukumar, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pravi. Uh, it was a wonderful session from uh, all the panelists. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll make uh, as much as simple. The my topic for today's discussion is ICU: the inevitable. So. In ICU, definitely we are, uh, most of the healthcare professionals are going to work in this setup. So are we ready to uh, prevent infection among ourselves? And second problem in our setup is most of the partially trained or inadequately trained will be going to work in ICU setups because of number of cases are going to be increased. So the chances of infections are going to be remarkably high. So let us go to the what is the burden of the disease or what are the burden of the infections among the healthcare professionals due to a COVID-19. Uh, the uh, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, they published the uh, article on clinical characteristics of coronavirus disease uh, 2019 in, Ch uh, in China. This was published in late February. Uh, as per their, uh, this thing, a total of 3.5% of LK workers were infected. This, is in Feb this was done uh, in uh, early February and published in late uh, February. This is a, just the disease was started, uh, COVID-19 was started in uh, China and the percentage of infection is 3.5. It may be underestimate. You can't just uh, rely on these uh, findings. Another editorial which was published in uh, late March uh, in a Lancet, which shows that the 3,300 healthcare workers were infected in a China, as per China's National Health Commission. It shows that 3,300 healthcare workers have been infected, and that to the this uh, is during early in the March. During the early in the March, number of cases were not so much. And the PPE is available in uh, China was much higher. And instead of even uh, adequate availability of PPEs, the infection rate was so high. And Anna, the same uh, editorial says in Italy, 20% infected. At the, this is at the end of uh, February 2020. This means the is a one of the best healthcare providers in the world, that is Italy, they have a best facilities for healthcare system. And they have got a 20% of uh, healthcare providers have been infected, even with the best possible PPEs and uh, even with the uh, uh, positive air purification devices, PAPRs, even with the PAPRs. So a recent study from a C a CDC, uh, they have, uh, during the morbidity mortality weekly report, uh, they have done a characteristics of healthcare personals with the COVID-19 uh, in an industrial state between uh, February 2012 to uh, April 9. Uh, according to them, it, uh, in, uh, as on April 9th, 9 1,282, that is 19% of healthcare providers who were tested or screened uh, were reported to be positive. This has been reported to the CDC. So this means around 48,000 healthcare providers have been screened for a COVID-19. Among them, 9,282 were positive for the disease. So they also state that this is likely to be underestimation because because healthcare provider status was available only for 16% of reported cases nationwide. This means screening was done only a 16% of the cases. So it means that there is a gross underestimation of number of cases uh, among the uh, healthcare providers. So what about India? Do we have a official data? No, we can't say we don't have an official data. There is a 
definitely a paucity of uh, official data for, uh, on uh, how many healthcare providers have been infected with uh, COVID-19. But there are uh, media reports. How much to relay? I don't know. But I'll quote uh, one report from uh, Economic Times Bureau. As per reports, there are over 2,000 healthcare workers across the country have been tested positive for coronavirus. And so far, 19 private hospitals have been sealed down. So it majority are from Maharashtra, like uh, Okada Hospital, Jaslok Hospital, these have been sealed down. There is a variation between, a difference between infections in other countries like USA and European countries and infections occurring among the healthcare workers in India. In healthcare workers in India, the majority of uh, uh, infected healthcare workers are from the non-COVID centers. But in other countries, uh, healthcare workers are getting infected when they are treating the patients in a COVID centers. So unlike other centers, because of number of tests done are less, second is asymptomatic patients or other carriers are coming and getting treated for some other disease uh, from a healthcare workers or a doctors. So infection rates are much higher in a non-COVID center rather than a COVID center in India. So how to protect ourselves? So one is limit the entry of virus into the facility. This has been uh, well explained by uh, Dr. Abdul. I should thank him. So he has explained how to prevent the entry of the disease uh, or virus into the facility. We need to, one is we should ask each and every person who are entering the facility, healthcare facility should wear the mask. They should maintain the hand hygiene. They should ask to uh, not to touch uh, uh, anything, at least uh, railings or any other things, or minimize the touch. And we should, at least if they are not able to buy a, a surgical mask or a N95 mask, we don't advise N95 mask for a general public, at least they can wear a cloth mask. It may not prevent infection to them, but it will prevent infection to the others. At least it reduces the dose of virus which is transmitted from a, a carriers are a, a, to the healthcare providers to the are to the others second is as soon as possible isolate or quarantine the infected healthcare providers this to prevent a spread of diseases to the other healthcare providers and to the community one and two second is prevent the uh, shutting down of the infrastructure or a facility because we have a scarce of uh, resources in india if we shut down the one major hospital, it will be used loss for the treatment of this pandemic and also to the treatment of other diseases. So we have to isolate the infected healthcare providers as soon as possible and give the proper treatment if they are symptomatic. Second, third, most thing is protect uh, PPEs, depending on where we are working, whether we are working in a, a critical care unit or HDUs or a COVID ward or a general setup. Based on that, we have to uh, over a proper uh, uh, personal protective devices. So a little bit about uh, droplet and uh, airborne. We know that uh, coronavirus disease is mainly uh, transmitted through the droplets. That is the majority of the droplets are more than 10 microns. So they, they, they will not suspend in the air. They will settle down on the ground. They will uh, settle down within a, a minutes. So the maximum distance they can travel is up to six feet are 1 to 1.5 meters. But in healthcare facility, what happens is the due to a aerogen generate, aerosol generating procedures, these droplets will convert into a droplet nucleus. So these droplet nucleus are less than 5 microns in the diameter. So this will be suspended in the air for a longer duration of time and this can be transmitted to a larger, dist larger distance. So even it requires a better filtering devices to prevent the infection. So the aerogen, uh, aerosol generating, uh, generating procedures has to be minimalized, minimalized in, a, in a hospital. Us should be uh, controlled in a, a centers where it is not required. So normally what happens is, this is the, uh, normally most of the coronavirus, this is the area where they can transmit up to a maximum of six meters, one to uh, six, sorry, six feet. So if you do a aerosol generating procedures, it may transmit more than 160 feet 
that more than five, uh, more five to six uh, meters. So the and even air, uh, this droplet nucleus will be suspended in the air for a longer duration of time. This will be more riskier. So we have to avoid or minimize the aerosol generating procedure, or we have to make sure that it has to be done in a certain uh, rooms. So already the previous speakers has explained what are the aerosol generating procedures, mainly intubation, extubation. I'm not going to explain. I flow nasal cannula. This is the one thing which has commonly used in the treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, ICU patients, even though it's uh, uh, Ministry of Health and family welfare does not recommend the HFNC in the treatment of uh, um, COVID-19 critically ill hypoxic patients. But this is the one which is commonly used in many other countries because this the disease does not look like an ARDS. It looks like more of HAPE, that is high altitude pulmonary edema, uh, which is patchy. So other things are uh, bag wall mask ventilation, NIVs. NIVs are also sometimes used in a COVID-19 intensive care units. This also can increase the risk of uh, getting infected. Bron bronchoscopies, endoscopies, open sectioning, nebulizations, tracheostomies. So definitely tracheostomies is one of the procedures we do commonly uh, for these patients because these patients when intubated requires a long-term ventilation. Tracheostomy is the one uh, thing which can prevent a ventilated associated pneumonia. Uh, so uh, tracheostomy has to be done for a long-term ventilation. But one thing we should remember, when we are, whenever we are doing a tracheostomy, either we should do it in a negative pressure rooms or there should be exhaust uh, should be there. Second thing is, uh, when we do a tracheostomy, we should make sure that we should pause a mechanical ventilation for a, a, when we are nicking the trachea so that the ventilation will not drive the air through the small port when we nick the trachea. Percutaneous tracheostomies are preferable, but whether open tracheostomy or percutaneous tracheostomy, we should pause the ventilation during a, a, a cutting of trachea or nicking the trachea. This has to be considered. And another decannulation is not a big problem, even though it generates the aerosols. We are going to decannulate uh, from the patient when they are recovered from the illness. So decannulation is not a big major uh, uh, problem for uh, infections. Other thing is a cardiopulmonary uh, resuscitation. This we face many patients, especially patients coming to a non-COVID units. If the patient's complains of a, a severe acute respiratory distress with the cardiac arrest, definitely if you are not prepared, if you are not having a proper PPEs, are you going to do a CPR? I think we should, uh, if you are suspecting a case of COVID, I think we should, we have the proper PPE, then we should do a CPR. Uh, if you are taking a risk, you are not taking a risk for yourself. You are taking a risk for an entire community and also for an entire facility. What are the recommendations to protect healthcare professionals? So I'll, uh, these things we know there are, there are uh, mainly there are four kind of uh, devices which protects us from inhaling a, a droplets or a infective materials. One is a face mask that is a, a cloth face mask. Uh, other three are surgical face mask, N95 mask, or FFP2, or PAPS. So uh, we don't recommend a cloth face mask for everybody, but general public can wear the cloth face mask to prevent the spread of the diseases to other persons, but it will not prevent uh, getting infected. So surgical face mask, of course, this will prevent from a droplet infection, but it will not prevent from aerosols. N95 mask, if that will be efficient against droplets as well as from the aerosol up to the 95%. It depends on how much seal. 95% doesn't mean that all the persons who are wearing the N95 will be protected for 95% uh, of the uh, droplets will be, uh, aerosols will be protected or filtered. So it depends on the how much is the sealing whether the properly fitted or not, because uh, before wearing N95 mask, they have to undergo a respiratory protection program. This is recommended by NIOSH, but during the pandemic, it is impossible to conduct uh, such a programs to the uh, all the healthcare providers. 
so in such a situation they we have to accept the risk versus a benefit so at least it may not protect a 95 percent even though it says properly fitted n95 mask definitely going to protect 95 percent of the aerosols but not improperly fitted n95 mask mm -hmm. Uh, PAPRs, this is the uh, positive air uh, purification respirators. These are costly, but it will uh, definitely up to 100% they will protect against uh, aerosols. And second thing is, these are very convenient and comfortable for a person who are wearing for a longer duration of time. Then fittings, of course, we know that the surgical masks are loose fitted, others are uh, fitted properly. Then use a uh, uh, surgical mask by the patients and anyone close contacts with the patient can be worn if they are not uh, come contact with the aerosol generating procedures and others are usually recommended in aerosol generating procedures. So COVID-19, I'll briefly discuss about the, uh, some of the setups, COVID-19 setup. Uh, this can be divided into three. One is a quarantine or isolation, isolation facilities, COVID ward and COVID ICU and HDUs. Quarantine and isolation facilities. Isolation facilities are for the, those patients who are COVID positive but asymptomatic. Quarantine is for the suspected cases. This can be either uh, can be done at home or at the hospital level. Both can be done at home or hospital level. COVID war, these are the symptomatic patients which requires less than uh, 5 liters oxygen, so less hypoxic. Uh, can be, this should be managed by uh, uh, a non intensivist maybe a uh, maybe a, a general physicians or others because if you are exposing the intensivist at this level to a covid ward the, there will be scarcity of intensivist to work at the covid icus covid icus are are hdus high dependency units are highly infective areas because aerosol generating procedures are done more infective uh, patients will be there and second, long duration of uh, duties and exposures will be uh, more. This is about uh, ICU layout, how, how it should be a uh, ICU layout. There should be a, uh, one entry and one exit. They both, are, both should be different. Uh, uh, the exit and entry should not be the same. And where immediately after the entry, there should be a downing areas. Uh, then they should enter into the ICUs. There should be, after that, uh, there should be a nursing station which should be separated from ant ante room or closed loop CCTV areas. Closed loop CCTV areas is very important in this because most of the things, suppose, uh, so one person is doing intubation, uh, there are three persons or uh, two persons are assisting, and the others can watch uh, from a distance in an ante room. Uh, whether the emergency requirement is required instead of going inside they should sit in an ante room and or watch the procedure if anything emergency if their requirement comes they can go immediately either with the cpr kit or going with the bronchoscopies or anything they can go from there this should be a closed loop cctv should be should not be recorded it should for only for monitoring purpose and uh, uh, regarding the doffing area, doffing area and downing area should be different and doffing areas should be at the exit and immediately following the doffing area, there should be a, a shower area or a bathroom to take a shower immediately after that. The, this is the recommendation from the CDC about the, what is the PPEs, uh, personal protective equipments. This, uh, we, most of us know that what is the requirement. So here what they suggest is uh, there is a goggles, a 95 mask, one pair of gloves, and isolation gown. But I, whatever I have seen, many of the, this thing, they require the head hood is recommended, and two pair of gloves are recommended, and there should be a foot cover. Uh, <coughs> and some of the uh, even we can accept a face mask when we are working in a, a COVID wards or isolation or a, a quarantine zones. So donning area, how to don, how to don, we know that uh, they should start from hand hygiene, wear a shoe cover, then uh, we have the first pair of gloves, we are the, then followed by a, a gown, then we should wear the respirator, followed by the goggles, then we are the hood, head hood, followed by the second pair of 
gloves. This should be the sequence of events in donning area. In a doffing area, it should re be reverse first step on. When you come out from the intensive care unit, you should first step on the uh, mat which has been uh, soaked with the hypochlorite solution. Then you should check for soiling. Then disinfect the outer uh, pair of gloves. Then remove the shoe cover. Remove the outer gloves. Then remove the hood. Uh, it should be all the procedure should be a slow. It should not be a very fast so that a lot of aerosols will be generated if you do it very fast. Then followed by uh, remove the gowns, goggles, then remove the second pair of gloves, wear the new gloves, remove the mask and clean the shoes with alcohol swab. Then you again step on the uh, hypochlorite solution mat, then take a shower and go out. This should be the procedure. But one thing is the doffing is most important uh, thing here in a COVID uh, pandemic than the donning. In surgical, we donning, we give a lot of importance for a donning. But here, we give a lot of importance for a doffing because it creates a lot of uh, uh, aerosols. And one, this, in doffing, uh, each, after each step, we should uh, disinfect our gloves. So what are the ICU etiquettes? Apart from this, what are the things we should follow uh, uh, so that uh, we should not we minimize the infection among ourselves, our family members, and also to the community? Don't carry any personal belongings inside the intensive care building. Either wristwatch, no wallets or currencies, no jewelries, no car keys. And these are few items. There are many things uh, which uh, may not be included. You should not carry which is doesn't require inside. Use only hospital uh, phones in emergency. Use a, a, a speaker instead of uh, uh, lifting the handset. Then every time use other person should uh, disinfect the uh, telephone. So hydration, this is very important. Before donning, uh, every person should uh, take a lot of uh, fluid or juices because uh, six hours or eight hours duties takes a lot of time. Second, and most importantly, we are donning with uh, PPEs, which uh, because of that, it produces a lot of uh, perspiration. So, and you can't drink in between because once we don the PPEs, we can't drink uh, water or juice. So you should hydrate yourself and you should use the uh, uh, washrooms, uh, bathrooms uh, before go uh, don uh, PPEs because you can't be uh, going in between like uh, regular ICUs. So this is very much recommended uh, when we're working in a COVID ICUs. So what are the things we should follow inside the intensive care unit? Use a separate stethoscope for each patient. Don't hang on your neck and move around the ICUs. We should use a separate stethoscope. And whenever we use it, at least at the end of the day, if you are auscultating only one patient, at the end of the day, we have to disinfect this uh, stethoscope. Point of care ultrasound is a better to uh, assess the intubations rather than a stethoscope. You can use a point of care a portable ultrasound if it is available but this is one thing which makes again things difficult because you have to you will be will not be having a 10 uh, ultrasound machines so it's difficult again it may spread the diseases that's one thing ventilator disconnection should be minimized this is one thing because it's produced a lot of aerosols you have to take care that uh, you should whenever you connect the ventilator you confirm uh, that the, these ventilator connections are properly connected uh, so disconnections will produce a lot of uh, aerosols stop ventilation and clamp the ett before disconnection so if you, first is avoid disconnections either for nebulization because these are ards patient does not require a, a bronchodilators. The only indication is if the patient is having a pre-existing bronchial asthma or a COPD, any spasm is there, then only use the nebulization. Otherwise, don't use nebulization regularly for a patient with, with a COVID-19 unless they have a pre-existing uh, diseases which contribute for a bronchospasm. ARDS usually does not cause a bronchospasm. So unnecessarily don't disconnect. If you disconnect it, before disconnecting, you pause the ventilation, clamp the tube, then only you disconnect. So this is two benefits. One is the peep loss will be minimized. Second is aerosols will not come out from the patients. Third is use the central monitoring stations, preferably, because this will be a helpful 
because we are not going every time to the patients instead of that the source control would be better if you use the central monitoring uh, system we can sit and monitor at the uh, one place whenever we require we can go instead of roaming in the icus is better to have a central monitoring system close loop cctv without recording is helpful without recording why i am stressing is because the, this can be misused close loop cctv is to uh, know the patient status uh, Uh, because one way we are vital monitors will be monitored with the central monitoring system closed loop cctvs may be helpful in monitoring other things uh, uh, will be helpful second is maintain electronic uh, uh, case registration uh, files instead of maintaining a manual electronic crfs are better uh, it's uh, easy nowadays it's very easy also if you are keep maintaining a manual record keeping should be separate uh, it should be in the separate room never bring to the patient near the patient care uh, because these get infected and again uh, uh, disinfection of the records will be very difficult you have to keep it and write somewhere else when you uh, are you keep some other person to write the things who is not entering the intensive care unit life saving instrument should not be inside a, a patient caring room it should be outside whenever required this should be brought inside the uh, uh, proper uh, patient caring room so every time we should disinfect the stethoscopes uh, uh, at least at the end of the uh, day because we are using separate stethoscope for each patients so we can disinfect uh, this at the end of the day with the alcohol rub that is a preferable and all the handles and the knobs should be disinfected uh, uh, as frequently we are following fourth hour disinfection we are uh, even though we are a non covid center we are following in a fourth hour disinfection uh, but i you can use a 1% hypochlorite solutions or on call rub to disinfect these knobs and especially this defibrillator whenever you use the defibrillator it can be cleaned with the uh, alcohol rubs this is uh, recommended uh, to clean, uh, clean the dis, uh, defibrillators with the uh, alcohol uh, rubs so what about intubation this is one of the procedure which produces the aerosol generating and it, is one which exposes uh, many people at once so intubation preferably done in a negative pressure rooms and minimize the number of persons when you are intubating a patient and avoid as far as possible avoid a crash intubations in uh, covid patients because it will expose uh, persons who are unprepared and how you can is one is you mini minimize the number to a two person or three persons and most experienced person will be doing uh, intubations and others will be assisting and remaining can wait outside or they can watch the uh, uh, cctv display so that if in case of emergency they can bring the airway trolley a bronchoscope or a cpr kit if the patient rs during the intubation they can come as soon as possible so intubations uh, briefly i will not discuss uh, detail the pre vaccination with a well fitted occlusive mask do you sh- don't use a non rebreathing mask or a simple mask for pre vaccination use the well fitted occlusive mask sedate and paralyze the patients uh, don't uh, do a awake intubation so uh, sedate and paralyze completely no mask ventilation only if it is required it should be with a minimum pressure and ve technique i'll tell you what ve technique is then rapid sequence intubations use view video laryngoscope this is to prevent a proximity between the patient and the performer that is a healthcare providers so if you are very proximal to the patients chances of a load of virus which are getting infected to us will be much more so to prevent that we have to use some scopes which is we can see from away that is one of the thing is a use of a video laryngoscopes and most experienced person should intubate there is no scope for showing a heroism here that and there is no scope for training in a covid unit you can't train a junior most person or a post graduates to intubate for a first time remember this this is something a ve grip we call it as our vice grip we normally we use a c grip for a, a mask ventilation in covid uh, to prevent a leakage uh, or to prevent aerosols which come out from the mask uh, this is the recommended that we put a both the thumbs above the uh, uh, mask and all the finger all the four finger remaining four fingers will be on the jaw and make a proper seal and the pressure for a, a ventilation should be minimized and 
other thing is ventilation should be started after the inflation of endotracheal tube never start a ventilation of before a cuff has been inflated always use a three hmes one is at the y piece one is inspiratory second is a inspiratory and third is expiratory limbs why i am stressing in the inspiratory limb ball so when the patient struggles there is a chance of a, a aerosols going into the inspiratory limb and also infecting the ventilators that is the why we uh, you uh, that's why i rec uh, usually it's recommended to have a, a, a viral filter or a hme filter at inspiratory limb balls generally we use one at a hme filter and one uh, another is a expiratory limb to, to prevent a contamination of the environment so here we advise a uh, three filters one at uh, y piece and another is uh, inspiratory another is expiratory and this is the sequence of how to uh, arrange uh, uh, sequence how is there this is a face mask uh, endotracheal tube followed by a viral filter and all other things should come after the viral or hme filter the extubation this is the mask cover uh, tube uh, technique uh, this uh, doctor doing a extubation should be stand behind a patient place the ventilating mask with the hme or the endotracheal tube stop a ventilator before doing extubation disconnect a ventilator uh, ventilator circuit place the fresh viral filter on the ett deflate cuff slowly remove the tube put oxygen tube below the mask till a patient does not uh, buck or cough so then only after that only you put a normal simple mask or a non reservoir mask this is a new technique which has been described for the covid patients first we use the normal uh, mask with a hme filter then we place over the uh, endotracheal tube then after that we deflate the cuff then after deflation the tube is slowly removed with the proper seal by the mask then if request patient is ventilated with the mask so what are the other safe practices never enter icu without a proper ppes even whatever may be the emergencies don't enter the uh, icus without a proper uh, ppes use checklist for donning and doffing this is one thing which is very important one person should be uh, with the checklist uh, then checking that whether the person is doing properly doing a donning and doffing this has to be checked donning area should not cross with the doffing area this should not, this is the one thing which should not happen in any icus or any setup with the, where they are treating the covid patients avoid or minimize the aerosol generating procedures institutional infection control protocols has to be maintained uh, motivate your staff and juniors to practice inf infection control uh, guidelines to conclude covid icus are inevitable for many of the healthcare professionals we need to work in a covid units and many of us may will come as a first timers are uh, so those are the persons who are going to get infected uh, more because of uh, inadequate training this then adequate training of staff before uh, posting it to the icus is very important especially uh, donning and doffing things has to be trained very well the there is no emergency in a pandemic one thing we should remember of course uh, when we are having a ppes we can't say that uh, patients suffer from a cardiac pulmonary the cardiac arrest you can't you wait that we, uh, so this thing um, we, if you are wearing a ppe you can go ahead with the cpr but in case if you are not with the proper ppe and we want patients having a cardiac arrest uh, with a suspect uh, suspected or a positive covid you how to wear the ppe then only do a, a cpr so protect protect yourself safeguard your juniors and staff this is very important so they will be motivated and they will be a, a encourage they should be they should be encouraged to work and thank you very much thank you